memoir instead. So very grateful. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about how Lawrence fits into uh, my current uh, postdoctoral project, which, um, as Alan said, is on uh, modernism and homelessness. And I'm going to draw some comparisons with other writers um, in at certain moments who, who wrote on homelessness. And I'm going to consider how Lawrence wrote about, thought about and experienced different forms of homelessness over the course of, of many years of his life. Now, I did hope uh, when Brenda asked for me for this title a long time ago, I did hope that I would have already kind of written the chapter on this and know exactly what was going on. But it is, uh, as, as research goes, it is um, kind of at an earlier point than I, than I might have liked. So I'm very happy. There are lots of kind of Lawrence experts here. So I'm really happy to take any suggestions as well as questions at the end. So the germ of my idea and my current work on modernism and homelessness came actually from a section of my PhD thesis. I think Howard is here, he'll probably remember this. Um, one that was ultimately cut for space that was on Lawrence and the Caribbean writer Claude McKay. And it was about this idea that, that both of these men might be considered as kind of transcendentally homeless. Um, the phrase coming from Lukács, and I'll talk more about that later, but the idea that they could both be considered as kind of strangers and strange lands, people who sought a sense of homeliness throughout their lives, who kind of wandered the world, uh, traveling restlessly, seeking something, um, some sense of homeliness, but being frustrated again and again. Um, so that's kind of where this project uh, began its life. But when I actually started working on it, I was quite intent upon uh, escaping Lawrence for a little while, or at least kind of setting him down for a little bit. Um, but I'm sure some of you will know that uh, escaping or eluding Lawrence is uh, is not always an easy feat, even if it might be desirable. Um, so at the base of my current project is the desire to bring the literal to bear upon the metaphorical with regards to uh, homelessness and modernism. So we're well accustomed to this idea of the modernist writer as metaphorically or transcendentally homeless. Uh, as what a figure who wanders, feels alienated, lives in this kind of often chosen exile and experiences maybe periods of impoverishment. Uh, but the mythologized modernist exile, of course, was almost invariably kind of highly educated, financially secure, middle class, Euro-American, white, often male. And their wanderings were often chosen, their experiences of alienation and exile largely voluntary and any impoverishment temporary. Such conditions indeed were viewed as ideal uh, for modernist formal experimentation and innovation. Homelessness then in many ways was one of the key themes of modernism kind of at the center of, of the idea. Yet a movement famously composed of exiles and emigres as well as poets unhoused and wanderers across language to quote Terry Eagleton and George Steiner there, appears to have been largely uninterested in the experiences of the more literally unhoused, the truly dispossessed. Unlike their Victorian counterparts, for whom the subject of the poor, the homeless, the destitute seemed to be endlessly fascinating, modernist writers and readers seemed far less inclined to write or to read about these people. At least in part, of course, this lack of interest in the dispossessed must be attributed to modernism's long association with this kind of elite upper class set and an aesthetic that seemed deliberately designed to exclude anyone exterior to this privileged group. Yet there is also a sense in which modern forms are simply not equipped to accommodate the very poor and the homeless. In Howard's End, of course, not quite a modernist text, but one that kind of teeters on the edge of modernism, E.M. Forster quips that his novel is not concerned with the very poor, they are unthinkable, and only to be approached by the statistician or the poet. This statement is related, at least in part, in jest, yet Forster's summary dismissal of the very poor as a viable subject for modern fiction and for the modern novelist is reflected in both the literature of the modernist period and in subsequent, scho uh, subsequent scholarship. I'm interested then in how modernists wrote about homelessness, uh, kind of real, literal homelessness, but also how they experienced it, how it impacted upon their work, and ultimately how our contemporary conceptions of homelessness were formed and transformed during the modernist period. So this work kind of goes from uh, George Orwell's undercover observations in Down and Out in Paris and London, uh, which is a book Luke Sieber calls the last in a tradition called uh, social investigation text. So these kind of 
things that were popular from the 1860s onwards from uh, uh, Greenwood's A Night in the Workhouse, whereby uh, kind of middle class men mostly would disguise themselves as homeless people to kind of infiltrate workhouses or other such institutions where the homeless would uh, would go. Um, so including that text, but also kind of Mina Loy and her depictions of uh, the homeless and bums in the in the Bowery. And also Tom Cromer's little known novel, Waiting for Nothing, of which mo a little bit more later, uh, which records his own lived experiences of depression era homelessness in the United States. So uh, Lawrence was lurking there in the back of my mind, as he often does, as I was developing this idea and kind of starting to work on it. He's a figure who, in this case, uh, true to form, fails to fit neatly into one category or another. Indeed, Lawrence combines the somewhat mythical, metaphorical, transcendental homelessness of the modernist exile with a sense of real, material homelessness and precarity, as we'll a explore a little bit later. Of course, literal and psychological homelessness are not at all mutually exclusive, and there are varying degrees and grades of the former. Homelessness, then as now, cannot be considered a homogenous or fixed condition or experience. Being homeless may mean sleeping on the street, but it may also today, as the UK housing charity Shelter clarifies, mean staying with friends or relatives, living in temporary accommodation, like a hostel or a b, &B squatting, or even living in poor conditions that affect your health. The significance of the term homeless has naturally shifted over the course of the last century, but by these modern standards, we can certainly class Lawrence as homeless. If we bulk slightly at that description, we can surely think of him as a writer who experienced precarity over many years of his life. And this precarity had a significant impact upon his literary output. All lives, as Judith Butler explains, can be described as precarious, but precarity in a more pre is a more precise cat category. Designating, Butler says, the politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks of support and become differentially exposed to injury, violence and death. Though Lawrence was perhaps never quite completely destitute then, he certainly lived precariously for much of his life and was in several senses homeless at various points. Even once an established writer, he was regularly without secure housing and dependent upon wealthier friends, family members, or admirers. Mabel Dodge Luhan gifted he and Frida the only home they would ever own together, though Lawrence refused to be named on the deeds of the property. Indeed, throughout his life and work, we see Lawrence and his characters resisting the idea of a fixed home, embracing a form of homelessness and rootlessness that seems liberating and invigorating. Yet the same characters who repudiate houses and stability, who make themselves willfully homeless, seek uh, a wider sense of, of home or homecoming or homeliness, a kind of spiritual or psychological homeliness that seems elusive and perhaps impossible. This talk will examine Lawrence's representations of homelessness, both literal and metaphorical, from two fairly early poems depicting London scenes of homelessness on the embankment. To Rupert Birkin's rejection of houses and homeliness, and uh, up to the homeless wanderings of Aaron Sisson and Aaron's Rod, a novel that itself seems homeless in some ways. In doing so, it explores how Lawrence's own precarious itinerancy impacted upon his work, both thematically and aesthetically, and probes his complex, even paradoxical, relationship to home and homelessness. Finally, I ask how this complex relationship might illuminate Lawrence's still uncomfortable position in relation to mainstream modernism. So in two poems, first composed in 1909 and finally published in 19, 1918 in uh, New Poems, both titled Embankment at Night Before the War, Lawrence describes encounters with rough sleepers on London's embankment. In the poem subtitled Charity, Lawrence's poetic voice is so disturbed by the gaze of a homeless woman he has offered money that he runs away with his soul in strife. And in the other, subtitle Outcasts, the narrator depicts the almost inanimate bodies of homeless men and women sleeping beneath the bridge at Charing Cross. Described as a human blight, they are forgotten, forgetting, till fate shall delete one from the ward. 
These two Embankment at Night poems, originally titled Brotherhood and After the Theatre, have received relatively little scholarly attention. They date from Lawrence's time teaching in Croydon and were likely first composed in summer 1909. Jesse Chambers, I don't know if the slide's gonna wanna change now. Oh. I'll try again. There we go. Uh, yes, Jessie Chambers recalls an occasion in late November of that year when she traveled down to spend the weekend. People can see that, yes? Can people see that? Okay, hopefully. Um, yeah, Jessie Chambers recalls an occasion in late November of that year, uh, 1909, when she traveled down to spend the weekend in London with Lawrence. After a trip to Selfridges and between a visit to the National Gallery and an evening at the theater, Chambers recollects that as night set in, Lawrence made her look at the human wreckage preparing to spend the night on the embankment. He wanted me, she continues, to see the bridges at night with the lights of the trams reflected as he had described them in his poems. The swathes of homeless souls under Waterloo Bridge, it would seem from Jesse's account of this evening, are merely one of the many sights of the city to Lawrence. Part of a spectacle, but spectacle to be gazed upon before one moves on to more interesting activities. According to John Worden, what shocked and fascinated Lawrence about this scene was how human beings could lose all pride in themselves. And Jesse's phrasing the description of the homeless here as a human wreckage, somewhat ironically, seems to completely deny the humanity of these people. It is in keeping, though, with widespread attitudes toward the homeless, or vagrants, as they were then often labelled, in the early 20th century. The homeless in this period were often portrayed in official reports as well as in newspapers as kind of disease-ridden, lazy pests, basically. Especially in London, they were perceived as an eyesore, as human rubbish that should be swept away like all of the other detritus of the city, and thus kept out of sight and out of mind. The poem subtitled Outcasts, originally after the theatre, composed probably in the summer before Jesse's visit, does seem to reflect at least some of these attitudes. Though there are also moments of ambiguity where human compassion seems to filter through, it seems possible, where Lawrence's narrator seems perhaps to acknowledge society's role in this unfortunate situation and regret it. Uh, it's fairly long, but I think it's worth reading in full here. So. Uh, I'll read it out. I couldn't fit it all on the screen, but I will uh, kind of go back to certain bits and put those on the screen um, in a moment. So, Embankment at Night Before the War, Outcasts. The night rain dripping unseen comes endlessly kissing my face and my hands. The river slipping between lamps is rayed with golden bands, halfway down its heaving sides, revealed where it hides. Under the bridge, great electric cars sing through and each with a floor light racing along at its side, far off, oh, midge after midge, drifts over the gulf that bars the night with silence, crossing the lamp-touched tide. A charring cross here beneath the bridge, sleep in a row the outcasts, packed in a line with their heads against the wall, their feet in a broken ridge, stretch out on the way, and a lout casts a look as he stands on the edge of this naked stall. Beasts that sleep will cover their face in their flank, so these have huddled rags or limbs on the naked sleep, save as the tram cars hover, past with the noise of a breeze and gleam as of sunshine crossing the low black heap. Two naked faces are seen, bare and asleep, two pale cloths swept by the light of the cars, foam cloths showing between the long low tidal heaps. The mudweed opening two pale shadowless stars, over the pallor of only two faces passes the gallivant beam of the trams, shows in only two sad places the white bare bone of our shams. A little bearded man, pale, peaked and sleeping, with a face like a chickweed flower, and a heavy woman, sleeping still keeping, callous and dour. Over the pallor of only two places, tossed on the low, black, ruffled heap, passes the light of the tram as it races out of the deep. Eloquent limbs in disarray. Sleep suave limbs of a youth with, yacht, with long, smooth thighs. 
hutched up for warmth, the muddy rims of trousers fray on the thin bare shins of a man who uneasily lies. The balls of five red toes as red and dirty bear young birds forsaken and left in a nest of mud. Newspaper sheets enclose some limbs like parcels and tear when the sleeper stirs or turns on the ebb of the flood. One heaped mound of a woman's knees as she thrusts them upward under the ruffled skirt and a curious dearth of sound in the presence of these wastrels that sleep on the flagstones without any hurt. Over two shadowless, shameless faces, stark on the heap, travels the light as it tilts in its paces, gone in one leap. At the feet of the sleepers watching stand those who wait for a place to lie down, and still as they stand, they sleep, wearily catching the flood's slow gait. Like men who are drowned but float erect in the deep, oh, the singing mansions, golden-lighted tall, Trams that pass, blown ruddily down the night. The bridge on its stanchion stoops like a pall to this human blight. On the outer pavement, slowly, theatre people pass, holding aloft their umbrellas that flash and are bright, like flowers of infernal moly over nocturnal grass. Wetly bobbing and drifting away on our sight, and still by the rotten row of shattered feet, outcasts keep guard, forgotten, forgetting, till fate shall delete one from the ward. The factories on the Surrey side are beautifully laid in black on a gold gray sky. The river's invisible tide threads and thrills like ore that is wealth to the eye. And great gold midges cross the cab chasm at the bridges above intertwined plasm. So Lawrence has clearly observed this nightly scene closely, perhaps on many occasions before taking Jesse to behold us. The poem consists of 19 stanzas of varying length, like the embankment sleepers, lines and stanzas stretch out and then huddle up, elongating then compressing, seemingly without regular pattern or reason. The poem's opening stanzas describe the slipping river, the lights of the lamps that ray it with gold bands, and the great electric cars that sing through under the bridge. Of the poem's narrator, we know only from the first lines that he stands, presumably unsheltered, with the night rain endlessly kissing his face and his hands. The seemingly welcome light rain, combined with the mention of, uh, I would say midges, but for rhyming sake, I said midges in the poem, midges later in the poem, suggests that this is a summer evening, though we find later that it is cold enough for people to need to hutch up for warmth. What does Lawrence's narrator make of this scene? Does he look on it with pity or disgust? Disgust? With compassion or indifference? I think we could read it either way, actually. The homeless here are reduced uh, chiefly to bodies or rather body parts. They are eloquent limbs in disarray, sleep suave limbs, huddled piles of rags with limbs like parcels feet in a broken ridge, a heaped mound of a woman's knees, a rotten row of shattered feet, balls of five red toes. The semantic field here is often biological, scientific. In the last stanza, the homeless sleepers are described as intertwined plasm, and the only two faces visible are pale clots, foam clots showing beneath the long, I do have that on the slide, uh, the long low tidal heap the mudweed opening two pale, shadowless stars. These two shadowless, shameless, pale, bare faces, lit by the light of the tramcars, are stark on the heap that is otherwise dark and dirty. They seem to disturb or even haunt the narrator, who returns to describe this image of the two lonely, pallid faces in several stanzas. Reminiscent almost of Ezra, Pound, Ezra Pound's In a Station of the Metro, in which faces in a crowd are equated to petals on a wet black bough. These two uncovered faces stand out and reveal the white bare bone of our shams. A phrase that seems to offer some acknowledgement of, a soci of society's collective role in all of this, our shams. The rest, however, like beasts that sleep, have covered their faces over with rags or limbs, whether for comfort, warmth, warmth, or to hide their identity, perhaps conceal their shame. 
Uh, so I've got an image here that was taken in 1902 by Jack London for his uh, 1903 book, The People of the Abyss. So only a few years before, before Lawrence was writing this poem. Uh, this is not on an embankment, but it's in Spitalfields Gardens. And you can see here the, the homeless women who are kind of covering their faces over either with, with clothes or, or with a hat, um, much in the way that Lawrence describes it. Um, but in Lawrence's poem, not only do these people cover their faces, but they are largely silent. There is, Lawrence's narrator relays, a curious dearth of sound in the presence of these wastrels that sleep on the, on the flagstones without any hurt. How one can be sure that they do so without any hurt is not made clear. In a later stanza, the scene beneath the bridge is contrasted with the world of the singing mansions and the theatre people who pass, holding aloft their bright and flashing umbrellas. The architecture of the city itself seems to collude in separating this world from that of the homeless sleepers, in covering up this eyesore. Thus, the bridge on its stanchions stoops like a pole to this human blight. The use of the phrase human blight here suggests both the unsightly nature of the scene and that kind of age-old association of homelessness with disease. But blight, of course, is not even a human disease. It's a, a plant disease. The equation of the bridge with a pole, of course, brings in associations with death. This is precarity at its most, most lethal. Yet it is fate, rather than exposure or disease or starvation, that shall delete one of these people from the ward. The narrator here, though not quite a social investigator in, in the vein of George Orwell, appears to be an insider neither in the world of the outcasts nor in that of the theatre people who pass. Yet, of course, on the night Jesse describes in November 1909, they were absolutely theatre people, stopping to gaze on the embankment scene before continuing with their evening. Toward the poem's end, even the factories on the Surrey side appear beautiful against the sky, in contrast to the depravity that goes on below the bridge. And in the last stanza, the rhyming of chasm and plasm seems to emphasize the social gulf or the abyss, to use a word popular in that period, between the embankment sleepers and the modern city where modern life goes on, tram cars run past, theatre people go about their business. Intertwined plasm here associates the homeless with this almost kind of primordial idea of life, um, this image of this kind of knotted mess of humanity, of limbs and limbs and blood and hair and all those kind of things. Few critics have written in any depth on this poem, and those who have tend to see it as actually a fairly sensitive portrait of the homeless. And I think you could, you can read it in that way, potentially. Uh, Douglas A. Mackey, writing in 1986, indeed describes it as a sympathetic picture of a group of beggars sleeping outside in the rain, which demonstrates the poet's admiration for the adaptability of these people. They are, he says, more blessed than those of the upper world because in the intertwined plasm of their sleeping limbs, they have an essential blood contact with the quick of life. We know how much uh, Lawrence was into the idea of kind of blood contact, blood intimacy, blood knowledge. Yet once what seems to be this poem's overarching attitude toward the homeless, feels much less compassionate actually, and certainly not celebratory. On display here is not at all a group li living in glorious blood intimacy with each other or with the world around them. Lawrence's outlook here, in fact, appears to mirror official views and rhetoric of the time. So for one example, the 1914 Metropolitan Poor Law Inspectors Advisory Committee on the Homeless Poor Sorry, long title, but um, for example, uh, acknowledges the embankment as a particularly well-known spot for the homeless, and it highlights the undesirable qualities of those who engage in this activity of, of sleeping on the embankment. So again, it must be remembered, uh, the committee report, that the class who sleep out are unclean in their person and verminous. Moreover, they are often filthy in their habits, and many complaints are made of the nuisances committed by them in public places. So 
a few years after after Lawrence writes this poem, and they're being described as kind of, of nuisances, as verminous, unclean. This is the kind of official opinion on the homeless. Outcasts uh, bears some resemblance to another roughly contemporary poem, comparing the lot of the embankment sleepers with that of another class. Uh, I hope you can read this. The Welsh poet W.H. Davis's 1911 poem, The Sleepers, contrasts the lives of homeless men and women sleeping on London's embankment and men being carried to work in the early morning. Uh, again, I'll read this out. As I walk down the waterside, this silent morning, wet and dark, before the cocks in the farmyards crowed, before the dogs began to bark, before the hour of five was struck by old Westminster's mighty clock. As I walked down the waterside this morning in the cold, damp air, I saw a hundred women and men huddled in rags and sleeping there. These people have no work, thought I, and long before their time they die. That moment on the waterside, a lighted car came at a bound. I looked inside and saw a score of pale and weary men that frowned. Each man sat in a huddled heap, carried to work while fast asleep. Ten cars rushed down the waterside like lighted coffins in the dark, with twenty dead men in each car that must be brought alive by work. These people work too hard, thought I, and long before their time they die. The workers described here, encased in their lighted coffins, are less alive than the embankment sleepers, made to awaken at such an unnatural hour that even cocks in the farmyard and dogs have not yet stirred. They are zombie-like, pale and weary men that frown. Both the sleepy workers and the homeless sleepers are described as huddled. All are being crushed, both physically and mentally, by a society that demands labour for money but offers little in return. All will die before their time, but the homeless at least have some sense of freedom, Davis suggests. In comparing this poem with Lawrence's, first composed only a couple of years before, it is clear that the poet's attitudes are quite different. In Lawrence, there is no sense that what the embankment sleepers are experiencing is anything like freedom. There is no spirit of the open road here, that kind of Whitman-esque idea that he would, would later talk about in the uh, the American essays. There's no kind of happy tramping going on here. There is a strict system, it seems, even in the way the men and women arrange themselves below the bridge in Outcasts, packed in a line with their heads against the wall and their feet in a broken ridge. Their bodies bend and are contorted uncomfortably to, con to fit the space they have because the city will offer them no more. Both Lawrence's and Davis's poems feature modern transportation prominently. The trams reference several times in Outcasts and the lighted car in the sleepers. In Lawrence's poem, the trams cast their light upon the faces of the homeless, almost like spotlights. They draw attention to the unsightly plight of these sleeping men and women. The sleepers, though, is more suggestive of the kinds of attitudes Lawrence himself would later demonstrate in poems like City Life where the narrator pities the corpse-like workers dragged back and forth to work by invisible wires of steel. The cars here are like lighted coffins. Modern technology and industrialization are, Davis suggests, just as deadening as destitution. Of course, Davis himself had been homeless years earlier, having spent much of his earlier life tramping across Britain and the United States, and even losing the lower part of his right leg in a train hopping accident. He later wrote a series of tramp memoirs, most notably the 1908 work, The Autobiography of a Super Tramp. By this time though, Davis was moving in rather different circles with George Bernard Shaw, Edward Garnett, W.B. Yeats, Ezra Pound, Edith Sitwell, among others. Edward Marsh introduced Lawrence and Davis in July 1913. And Lawrence had been very keen for the meeting. Davis, he thought, seemed so nice in all his work. Davis in return was keen to have Lawrence's autograph for his collection. And Lawrence was initially taken with Davis and soon invited him to visit Germany. But in an October letter to Marsh, his attitude seems to have changed significantly. He expressed how furious Davis made him, criticizing his work, uh, including the nature poems, which when he read them again in Italy seemed incredibly thin, and his accent, his Welsh accent, 
Interestingly, part of Lawrence's critique of Davis is that he's made himself a tame bird, that he is shut up now in his Seven Oaks room, proud of the gilt mirror in his romantic past. He should, Lawrence suggests, grow his wings again. Lawrence is critical here of the, uh, the kind of conventionality, the fixity that Davis has adopted in his later life. And this is what makes him incredibly uninteresting to Lawrence. Um, perhaps were, were Davis to take to the tramp again, Lawrence might find him a little bit more interesting. So return to the embankment poems though. The poem subtitled Charity, first titled Brotherhood, is set on a white, wet night similar to that described in Outcasts. The subtitle and former title, however, seem to signal immediately a departure from the themes and attitudes of that poem. Again, I'll read it uh, in its entirety here. So, Embankment at Night Before the War, Charity. By the river, in the black wet night, as the furtive rain slinks down, dropping and starting from sleep, alone on a seat, a woman crouches. I must go back to her. I want to give her some money. Her hand slips out of the breast of her gown, asleep. My fingers creep carefully over the sweet thumb mound into the palm's deep pouches. So the gift. God, how she starts and looks at me and looks in the palm of her hand and again at me. I turn and run down the embankment, run for my life. But why, why? Because of my heart beating like sobs, I come to myself and stand in the street spilled over splendidly with wet, flat night, flat lights. What I've done, I know not. My soul is in strife. The touch was on the quick. I want to forget. Why does Lawrence's narrator want to forget? Why is this encounter so disturbing for him? Why is his soul in strife? Why does he run away? It is perhaps because in this poem, unlike its companion piece, if we can refer to it as such, the homeless woman wakes up and looks him in the eye, thus confirming her humanity and her agency. She is not merely an uncovered face in a crowd of outstretched bodies, but a person with whom Lawrence's narrator experiences a real human interaction. This is another photograph from Jack London's People of the Abyss, this time of homeless men on the embankment. So most of these men appear to be sleeping, kind of covering their faces, at least partially, like those de depicted in Outcasts. But one man we can see, uh, the man nearest to the photographer, stares back directly in a move that seems to both challenge the observer, photographer, and emphasize the agency and humanity of the homeless man. It's confronting. If we look at his face, it is, um, in a way, moving, perhaps disturbing. In the case of Lawrence's narrator, there is perhaps also a sense that in offering this gift of money, he has invaded the crouching woman's personal space. Is he embarrassed about this? Perhaps embarrassed that she saw him, embarrassed that he did not or could not afford to give her more money. While the answer is quite possibly some combination of these factors, Lawrence leaves it ambiguous. This poem does certainly seem a more sympathetic portrayal of London's homeless, or one among them at least. If we turn to Lawrence's original title for this poem, Brotherhood, might we infer that the narrator here has a fellow feeling for this homeless woman that seems absent in Outcasts? Perhaps in a phenomenon described in James Hanley's 1931 story, Rubbish, the narrator sees in this woman his own potential future. Indeed, the possible fate of any member of a society in which homelessness is allowed to persist. In Hanley's story, Rubbish, a homeless man who has returned to his native Liverpool after many years away is troubled at the attention he receives, uh, intense stares and odd treatment that seems to him evidence of a peculiar madness developed in his hometown. But a young passerby explains to him, rather, that what they are staring at is not what is not a what you are, but at what they might become. Could this be what sets the narrator's heart to beating like sobs in Lawrence's, Lawrence's poem? The idea that that this could be his, that this could be a glimpse into into his future, and perhaps is this something that Lawrence ever thought about? I bring particular and extended attention to these two poems because, although they are certainly not among the greatest or most important that Lawrence wrote. They are in some ways unusual. Lawrence's attitude toward the homeless here 
feels in some ways rather Victorian, perhaps unsurprising given the date. But we have few examples of modernist writers offering such extended treatment, uh, such an extended treatment of homelessness. So in the years following the initial composition of the two embankment poems, Lawrence would often figure himself and his characters uh, in different ways as homeless. So I'll just pick out a couple of examples here. So we've got um, in Twilight in Italy, Lawrence recalls an instance in Switzerland where in a bid to escape both the rain and the people on a Sunday walk, he took refuge under a bush and was so glad to be there homeless without a place or belonging, crouching under the leaves in the copse by the road that I felt I had like the meek inherited the earth. Although this is, of course, only a very brief moment, hardly comparable with a real experience of homeless like, like the embankment sleepers, it suggests the extent to which ideas of homelessness and placelessness have acquired positive connotations in Lawrence's mind by this time. And in Women in Love, perhaps most prominently, Lawrence's protagonists advocate for a kind of homelessness in their rejection of houses and fixed homes and the staid conventional lives which, which, with which they are associated. Birkin in particular finds the thought of a house and furniture of his own hateful. Appalled by the horrible tyranny of a fixed milieu, he is at home neither in the world of Tom Brangwen nor truly in the more modern mechanised world embodied by Gerald's coal mines. To Ursula's comment that one must nevertheless live somewhere, Birkin replies that one should just live anywhere, not have a definite place. I don't want a definite place. As soon as you get a room and it is complete, you want to run from it. Now my rooms at the mill are quite complete. I want them at the bottom of the sea. It is a horrible tyranny of a fixed milieu where each piece of furniture is a commandment stone. Ursula and Gudrun, too, can think of nothing worse than the greyness and ordinariness of a fixed home. Such fixity must surely threatens one, threaten one's identity and liberty. Gudrun feels that one must be free above all else. One must not become uh, one's address. For all, rejection of houses and furniture and clothes is equated with a rejection of the beloved past. Homelessness in these instances is equated with freedom. It means leaving behind the old world and forging forward, finding new ways of living meaningfully, perhaps in the utopian nowhere Birkin imagines, where one needn't wear much clothes, none even, where one meets a few people who have gone through enough. It is significant that in 1918, when the two Embankment at Night poems finally saw publication in new poems, that the new titles specify uh, that the scenes depicted date from a time before the war. One of many effects of the war upon life in Britain was the striking reduction in the homeless population, as many homeless, uh, nearly uh, the vast majority of the homeless population were, were men, and many of these were conscripted into the army or otherwise kind of put to work. For the Lawrences, of course, quite the opposite was the case. War led eventually to their expulsion from Cornwall and a loss of the sense of homeliness they had found there. Being forced to leave their cottage in Zeno was particularly difficult emotionally and unfortunate financially. The rent there was very cheap and already paid up until March of 1918 and the Lawrences could ill afford to pay to live anywhere else. Somewhat ironically then, the two poems featured uh, featuring the embankment homeless were finally published during a period in which the Lawrences were themselves essentially homeless. Financial straits had compelled Lawrence to submit his old notebooks for publication in order, as he put it, to make a trifle of money. One wonders whether Lawrence himself made such a connection. Following their expulsion from Cornwall in October 1917, though, he and Frida staved off real poverty only through the generosity of friends and moved frequently between accommodations provided uh, by these friends and family members. From HD's flat in Bloomsbury to Dolly Radford's Chapel Farm Cottage in Her Hermitage near Newbury and later to Mountain Cottage in Middleton by Worksworth near Cromford, where the rent, some 65 pounds a year, was to be paid by Lawrence's sister Ada. They moved to the latter, uh, the Mountain Cottage, in May 1918, and it was in some sense a kind of homecoming for them, 
but Lawrence quickly reported feeling very lost and queer and exiled there. As Andrew Harrison notes of this difficult period, the kindness of friends was a great support, but the combination of homelessness, poverty, and the sense of persecution meant that it was, as Lawrence described it in a letter to Cecil Gray in October 1917, like being slowly suffocated in mud. In the same letter, he observed that it is prison and misery to be in other people's houses. I think we can relate to that. The previous day, he had described their situation to Catherine Carswell as the, fa the fag end of poverty. So Lawrence was yeah, obviously very much aware of, of their situation, of their precarity. A few months later, in March 1918, uh, in a letter to Mark Gertler, Lawrence expressed his desire for freedom and movement. I feel like a wild cat in a cage, he says. I long to get out into some sort of free, lawless life. At any rate, a life where one can move about and take no notice of anything. I feel horribly mewed up. I don't want to act in concert with any body of people. I want to go by myself or with Frida. Something in the manner of a gypsy and be houseless and placeless and homeless and landless. Just move apart. This diatribe is reminiscent of Birkin's desire to live anywhere or nowhere, to eschew houses and possessions and rootedness and other people entirely. Yet simultaneously, Lawrence was, throughout 1918, hopeful of returning to Cornwall and to the cottage at Higher Trilogurvin, even attempting to sublet it to Virginia and Leonard Wolfe in January, rather than risk losing it for good to other tenants. What's more, Lawrence had, almost immediately upon leaving Cornwall, begun to indulge again in fantasies of Rannanim, that, visit, that vision of an ideal, imagined community to which his mind would often turn in difficult times. Underlying these protestations against houses and homes and fixity seems always to be a quest for psychological or spiritual homeliness then. This is evident in Lawrence's subsequent so-called savage pil pilgrimage, the self-imposed exile of the post-war years. In this period, he often expressed feelings of alienation, homesickness and psychological homelessness. Lee Jenkins has suggested that Lawrence belonged only in transit, yet perhaps, much like Richard Summers in Kangaroo, Lawrence was simultaneously at home anywhere and never at home during these restless years. By the time he was finally able to leave England in late 1919, he had become, as he wrote to Amy Lowell, a sort of charity boy of literature. Still struggling to support himself entirely through writing, he had arrived in Italy in the November of that year with only £9 in his possession and a further £12 in the bank in London. Over the course of these itinerant years, we see some of the clearest expressions of what we might call Lawrence's transcendental homelessness. The phrase originates in George Lukács' 1916 work, The Theory of the Novel, in which he sees the condition of the modern Western mind, the mind that produced the novel, as transcendentally homeless. Lukács identifies uh, as key to, to transcendental homelessness, this idea of a nostalgia for utopian perfection, a nostalgia that feels itself and its desires to be the only true reality. Such a nostalgia is clearly evident in Lawrence's letters and writings of this period. He travels through Italy, Salon, Australia, the United States and Mexico. Uh, is, see him seeking out a sense of connection and homeliness, but frequently being disappointed and instead feeling alienated and yearning for elsewhere. In Sicily, which he often professed to liking much more than Capri, he writes of feeling like a strange lost soul with a, with a bit of Heimweh for Capri. Earlier in Capri, he had felt similarly lost and grief-stricken. I, I get a strange nostalgia for I know not what. I feel like bursting into tears and begging Parthen Parthenope and Leucothea, please to let me go, Abba Vohen. Later in 1922, during his stay in Australia and in 1925 in New Mexico, Lawrence would admit to some Heimweh for Europe. His preference for the, for the German word Heimweh over the English homesickness and the German question, Abba Vohen, of the Capri letter seem further indicative of a sense of cultural and personal alienation. English words are insufficient to describe a feeling he cannot quite himself understand. Lawrence's strange nostalgia for something unknown to him seems the epitome of transcendental homelessness. 
of a longing which cannot name its exact object. Lawrence's Heimweh then is perhaps not equivalent to the English homesickness. Capri, after all, was not home, but a more pro profound, complex emotion. It is closer, perhaps, to the Welsh Hiraith, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, or the Cornish Hiraith, with which Lawrence was perhaps familiar given the happy time he spent in Cornwall, associated with an intense, bittersweet sense of nostalgia for a place, time or person that may no longer exist. Works inspired by and composed during Lawrence's time in Ceylon, Australia, and later in the United States and New Mexico, continue to register this nostalgia and this concern with home and homeliness. Much like Birkin, the protagonist of Kangaroo, is restless and resists the idea of a fixed home, while Jack in The Boy in the Bush uh, feels that the very word home has lost its meaning. Later in New Mexico, when Lewin offered him the, the Kiowa Ranch, Lawrence refused to be named on the deeds. Only Frida was, finally. Home ownership was ne had never appealed to Lawrence. He had expressed many years earlier to Louis Burroughs how inconceivable the idea was for him and that any home they might have would need to be registered in her name only. So we can see something of this ongoing dialectic here, this resistance to homes and houses and to fixity, but also, also this kind of undergirding desire to find a deeper sense of homeliness in different cultures and new places, in concert with others, in the ever elusive Rananim. So in the final short section, I promise it is very short, uh, of this talk, I'm interested in how Lawrence's homelessness and precarity impacted upon his literary output. So how the conditions in which he lived and worked affected how and what he wrote, both thematically and aesthetically, and how taking these things into, into more consideration might alter the way we look at these works, I suppose. We know that frequent uprootings, like those in the months following the expulsion from Cornwall, exercised a considerable impact upon Lawrence's work. It was easier to produce shorter pieces, essays and poetry during periods of instability. Novels required a more sustained focus and thus perhaps a more permanent base. I take the example here of Aaron's Rod with his disjointed composition history over a period in which Lawrence was living precariously and itinerantly as a case study in how homelessness, both metaphorical and literal in this case, affected his literary work. So first begun at 44 Mecklenburg Square, in late 1917, soon after the painful expulsion from Cornwall, Aaron's Rod would be composed in fits and bursts over the next three and a half years. Work on what he was now calling another daft novel was soon interrupted though, by frequent moves between different friends' homes. And it resumed in late February of 1918, if very slowly and fitfully. So there were many kind of stops and starts in this writing process. And in mid-September 1918, he was still continuing to work at it, but slowly. And this ceased for some time uh, soon after June 1919. And he then resumed in mid-July 1920, so after quite a while, having scrapped probably a considerable amount of the earlier work. And Aaron's Rod was half done in September 1920. He complained to Compton Mackenzie, however, that though the novel did jerk one chapter forward now and then, he could not foresee how the second half would emerge. Later that month, he comments that the novel has stuck halfway, but I don't care. And he abandoned it by the end of November, feeling that he could not end it. In April 1921, in Taormina, he was working on it again. And finally, in Baden-Baden, it was completed by the 1st of June revised over the rest of that year and published in April 1922 in the USA and June in Britain, while Lawrence was traveling in Ceylon and Australia. Lawrence called the work that resulted from this fitful and often frustrated and frustrating process, the last of my serious English novels, the end of the rainbow women in love line. It had been written, he said, and it come and had to, it had to be written, he said, and had to come to such an end. Yet Aaron's Rod, has not often been taken as a serious novel, nor does it appear, at least on the surface, to have a great deal in common. Picture over there. Uh, to have a great deal in common with the rainbow or women in love. It has more frequently been grouped, of course, with the later work Kangaroo and the Plumed Serpent as leadership novels. But more useful, I think, is to look at Aaron's Rod as a work that sits on the brink between two periods and 
I suggest here to see it as a product of precarity, as a kind of homeless novel itself. Much like Kangaroo, which Lawrence himself called a funny sort of novel where nothing happens, Aaron's Rod had, has often been cited as a novel that lacks in plot and structure. Indeed, the itinerant, itinerant, uh, itinerant life of both the hero and the author is reflected in the loose plot and episodic narrative of Aaron's Rod. Since publication, critics have routinely dismissed the novel as one blighted by its lack of organization, its directionless plot, its chaotic structure. Fra Frank Kermode commented in the 19 1970s upon its virtually complete indifference to the form of the novel, while others have seen it as a picaresque, and some have read it as uh, some have read the plot as a kind of journey towards a potentially transformative homosocial friendship. More recently, critics like Bridget Chalk have suggested that the novel's form and structure were in fact conscious decisions on Lauren's part. Its flaws, she argues, are purposeful manipulations of established narrative form that seek to disunite the genre from its socializing function. Chalk reads Aaron's Rod as an inverse buildings roman, one in which Aaron gets progressively further from a sense of accommodation with society, further from the traditional sense of homeliness, uh, the idea of a, wife, a house with a wife and children. Aaron leaves the unspe unspeakably familiar of his home without any clear motivation or plan, barring Rod and Lily, the people he meets along the way during his wanderings through London and Italy seem largely inconsequential to whatever plot there may be. The novel's end, the conversation between Aaron and Lily, that ends abruptly, offers no real sense of conclusion. As Chalk notes then, the beginning resembles an end, the middle does not perform any connective function, and the end merely trails off in mid-conversation in a chapter with the title suggesting disintegration and dissemination words. Tom Cromer's aforementioned semi-autobiographical semi account of Depression-era homelessness is similarly picaresque and episodic, with one chapter bearing little relation to the next, seemingly plotless. Like Aaron, Cromer's protagonist like, lacks interiority and drifts from place to place, seemingly without purpose, without eyes on what the future might bring. So for Lukács, the novel is the form best suited for the condition of transcendental homelessness. It is the epic of an age in which the extensive totality of life is no longer directly given, in which the imminence of meaning in life has become a problem, yet which still thinks in terms of totality. But perhaps, as Forster appears to have suggested, the modern novel was not equipped to house stories of those who were more literally homeless. Fragmented itinerant lives do not lend themselves readily to neat linear plots. Precarity like that experienced by Lawrence and in a far more extreme form by Tom Cromer does not lend itself to the construction of a novel of conventional structure or co coherent organization. We might read Aaron's Rod as among many other things, a homeless precarious novel one that expresses in its form and plot not only the crisis of modernity, the crisis to which modernism is understood to respond, but a more personal crisis of homelessness, rootlessness, exile, expulsion, that is both liberating and devastating. In coming to a conclusion, I'm conscious that I have myself probably delivered uh, a bit of a fragmented talk with something of a plotless arc. So what in the end do Lawrence's writings on different forms of homelessness reveal when read together? What might the two embankment poems have to say about Lawrence's later restlessness, his resistance to the idea of a fixed home and his simultaneous search for some possibly impossible sense of wholeness and homeliness of harmony with what he called the circumambient new universe? What do Lawrence's ambiguous, potentially troubling, dehumanizing depictions of the embankment homeless tell us about Lawrence in relation to his own precarity and housing instability, his views on class, his relationship to modernist, to modernism. The most truthful answer is that I'm not entirely sure yet. This is still kind of a work in progress, but reading Lawrence in relation to homelessness in this wider sense does further reveal, I think, the complex nature of his relation to home, to class, to modernism. Lawrence's relation to modernism indeed remains ambiguous 
He continues to be, as Howard J. Booth notes, an unsettling figure in metropolitan accounts of modernism. In his life and work, Lawrence appears to have lived prophetically by Martin Heidegger's declaration in the 1940s that homelessness is coming to be the destiny of the world. Much like Birkin, Lawrence lived both physically and intellectually, anywhere and nowhere, eschewing permanence in favor of a continually evolving provisional self. Such a self could have no fixed address, no permanent home. He could not be confined to one house, one look. Oh, he could no more be confined to one house, one location, than he could remain fixed in his thinking, stagnant in his art, or unchanging in his beliefs. Thank you. No, not particularly, no. Yeah, thanks very much, Laura. I see people uh, people clapping. Uh, Alan has had to leave us, so I've agreed to uh, chair the questions, which usually happen and usually arise in a fairly kind of fluid way. Um, I think if you do want to contribute, probably the easiest way is to either raise an electronic hand or switch your camera on and raise an actual hand. Which is probably just as just as easy. Um, I wanted, yeah, Howard. I'll come to you just in a second, Howard. I'm just taking chair's uh, prerogative here and uh, just saying I was really fascinated, Laura, by um, your discussion of the speaker's attitude to the woman in the charity poem. And I really love maybe at some point in the discussion if we could if we could come back to that because it, it is worked through a similar scene in the white peacock isn't it and there um the speaker and the the narrator cyril his feelings are described as being shame and grief it's quite interesting but they but the reaction to the to the woman in both cases is deeply ambivalent and rich and um unresolved i think um, so it'd be wonderful if we could return to that at some point in the in the discussion. I think that's really fascinating. Howard, yes, it's, now, a, now it's the prerogative of the former supervisor. I knew uh, you were yes, so poor, poor, poor uh, Laura. Um, <laughs> me again. Yeah, uh, I probably because I say the same thing, just saying three things. And I was thinking about this only the other day, the, the wonderful novel with Peter Preston introduced me and others to Sandwich Man by Walter mm. Bailey, uh, which of course ends with the protagonist who's, who's caught between being a, a University of Nottingham student, Andrew, and um, <clears throat> um, uh, being a, a, a minor and can't resolve this kind of scholarship boy um, dichotomy and, and ends that novel uh, home. So a reference to Lawrence also that the end as the snow is falling seems to be a reference to choices. Uh, the dead. So that, that that novel always comes to mind when mm. we mention that homelessness. There's, there's a very interesting uh, text that's, that's between Lawrence's time and um, after the Second War, a 30s text from the same period as uh, Orwell, who, who you mentioned. But um, I, I particularly wanted to come back to Forster, actually, for, for, for very briefly, and this links in with uh, uh, Andrew's point about those poems, really, and it, it's just, um, I mean, I could kind of quibble about the, the narrator of Howard's End being Forster, because actually the narrator yeah. of Howard's End is a very strange narrative voice. The narrator of Howard's End goes and has a chat with his greengrocer at one point in the novel. A very strange narrative um, uh, voice that Forster constructs in Howard's End, very different from his other novels. But one of the things that, that, that did come to mind, and it's never struck me before, is that that all important scene in Howard's End, when um, um, Margaret and Helen meet Henry Wilcox again, and he gives his wrong advice about Leonard Bast leaving mm. the Porphyrian, occurs on the embankment. And, mm. and Leonard Bast becomes, of course, effectively homeless mm. as a result of that advice because he, he changes uh, his job he, he and then he loses that job and then he has to undertake that walk to to Shropshire and he's left in this kind of physically exhausted state with his 
heart condition that, that, that mm. is, is one of the things, along with Charles Wilcox, that results in, in, in his death. So uh, the poem predates Howard's end, but of course Forster really knew and admired his, uh, his Forster. So, so that, that, that might have been in play by the time the poem was actually published. And at, at any rate, it makes a fascinating point of comparison, I think, for the use of um, the embankment in modern literature. Anyway, just a, just a suggestion, yeah. really. No, thank you for that, Harold. That's really that's really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, yeah, I read reread um, Howard's End recently, but yeah, the that occurring on the embankment definitely, and then kind of the the sort of tramp uh, that Leonard Bast undertakes. Yeah, definitely, it's definitely something I'm gonna gonna write about. Andrew, I think Jane had a hand up. Did you, Jane? Yes, I did. Thanks, Kate. Um, I mean, it's just an observation, um, Laura. Firstly, thank you very much for your talk, which I very much enjoyed. And it was the images you were showing us of the men and women on the embankment and then the, the poem, um, which I wasn't that familiar with. And, um, you know, Charing Cross beneath the bridge, sleep in a row, the outcast packed in a line with their heads against the wall. And that very much reminded me of Henry Moore's um, The Underground Shelter Drawings, which are only sort of 1940, where people were forced to be homeless um, mm. and seek shelter underground. And, and the, you know, in a very similar sort of location. And I mean, I haven't got any conclusions to draw from that, but it just seemed an, an interesting comparison to me you know it, it brought back sort of thoughts of the two and how people can be forced to be homeless as were these other people but in a different manner you know so just something for you to think about but uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk I enjoyed it no thanks very much Jane yeah absolutely um kind of the the way in which the war makes people homeless is definitely something that I'm gonna think about and also that that image of the people kind of uh, laid together, almost like packed in like sardines on the embankment. It's kind of uh, yeah. also makes you think of um, these. Uh, so there were kind of different, uh, not homeless shelters, but kind of accommodations that people could pay for. So you could have like a a, a penny, uh, what do they call it? Like a, a penny hangover or something like that, where you could kind of sleep in a row um, with your hands over Kind of a piece of rope and sleep like that but you could also sleep um there were ones that were called uh coffin kind of yeah coffin um flops i think they call them flops sometimes mm -hmm. um where you would kind of it would it was like kind of being in a coffin and that would cost more than uh, than sitting down but yeah, yeah. So, yeah i mean in, in henry moore's uh sketches uh, the underground shelter drawings i mean people are just like little mummies one after the other in a row. And it, it's just that image of, you know, so many people with nowhere to go, basically, nowhere to, they're just homeless. Um, that was very striking to me, a resonance yeah, with love. I'll well, look into those, yeah, thank you. Yeah, anyway, thank you. Thanks. There are two hands up, and now, unfortunately, I have to go on screen names. Is it Shani? Perfect, yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect, Shani. Um, First of all, thank you so much for the talk. It was really a, a rich talk, a lot to think about. Um, I have two questions, but since Kathleen also has her hand up, I'm just gonna ask one. And then if there's time, maybe I'll get a chance to ask a second one. So I was trying to apply a psychoanalytic lens to some of what you shared about Lawrence's um, resistance at certain points, whether through a character like Birkin or or just as himself as Lawrence, his resistance to to fixity or to having a home or to domesticity and and furniture and so forth. And I was wondering if you had come across anything or thought at all about whether it could be some sort of defense mechanism, like a kind of reaction formation against what he went through when he was growing up in his childhood, you know, from a biographical 
perspective mm -hmm. in his home with his parents and the unhappiness um, that sort of permeated his home, whether, you know, because you talked about how he also, on the other hand, had this longing, this yearning, this homesickness. So there was this other part that would sometimes break through. And so it just made me wonder about whether there might be some sort of defense mechanism going on there that underneath it, perhaps he was actually yearning for, for an ideal home. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we can all agree that uh, all of our problems come from our parents and from <laughs> from our childhood. So you know, I would enjoy that one, huh? at least. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think you're definitely right there. I didn't kind of go into more more depth about that about kind of the the Eastwood home uh, context, but there's definitely definitely more that you could say there for for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kathleen. Um, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Laura, so much for that presentation. Um, I was particularly interested in the point you made about uh, the sort of modern propensity for modernist writers. Uh, I was thinking about James Joyce, actually, and his self-exile. Um, mm -hmm. Laura, what, what do you think about the importance that uh, that homelessness but at at what you refer to as sort of um lawrence's societal level i mean this is this wasn't the real destitution right you made a distinction i really liked your sensitivity to the to the uh, distinction between people who are really homeless with nowhere to sleep at night i mean mm. we, we all know that lawrence and frida did suffer but maybe not to that extent they had a you know, friends, affiliations, connections. Um, um, so that was one one thing that really struck me that you make this you made this distinction. But in in the light of modernism, um, was it a sort of fashion? Was it important for them to feel? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of Joyce's quote. You know, the sow that feeds its farrow. They 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 found it very important to fly the nets. You know, the social yeah. societal nets, as it were. Do yeah. you think that apart from the, you know, the Freudian psychoanalytical perspective of Lawrence um, preferring to be homeless rather than having a home, since home to him represented such pain and trauma. So sort of he had, you know, there's a Japanese expression for missing something that you, you've never known, really, mm -hmm. you know, wanting a home, but to him home was pain. So I'd rather not have home at all. But then, yeah. then you know, switching to the modernist sort of, um, meaning of homelessness, which was a bit more of a this fashionable sort of you know a new way to go. What's your take on that, Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, there's a there's a lot a lot to be said about that. 